Hebrews 11 and uh, one verse there, verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Any theology course begins with what I'm going to give you this morning. There's no better place to begin studying uh, God than with the Word of God itself. And uh, atheists and humanists and agnostics and evolutionists, they question the existence of God. Or at the very least, they question God's involvement in the affairs of human history, uh, if indeed he made it. Uh, some of the early founding fathers in the United States were referred to as deists. They believed that there was a, some divine creator involved in putting together the visible creation and starting things off, but then afterwards he sort of backed off and let it run its own course and without any personal involvement in the affairs of men or revealing himself to men. And so sometimes critics and skeptics will draw a distinction between a deist and a theist. A theist believes not only is there a God, but he's involved in men's lives. A deist believes there was a God, but otherwise he's, he's not involved in the day-to-day -day needs and the lives of men. But any study of basic theology uh, has to begin with establishing the, the, the uh, existence of God. Now, you and I couldn't prove absolutely conclusively beyond anyone's doubt that God exists because I don't see God. I can't see him the way you and I see one another. Hebrews 11.6 states, He that cometh to God must believe that he is. So there is some measure of faith that's required on your part. And uh, what you and I have to do is we take the best evidences, the best arguments that we can find, and from that infer that God must exist. If this is true, then that must be true, even if I can't prove it to everyone else's satisfaction. Excuse me. It's difficult for the natural man, the unsaved man, the unbelieving man, to believe in something that he can't see, uh, taste, touch, smell, um, or hear, the five senses. But um, the Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, uh, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The Bible doesn't set out to prove that God exists. It, it begins by assuming that God exists. The, the Bible figures it must be self-evident to everybody that there's a creator bigger than you that put the universe together. So it doesn't waste your time trying to prove God existence, God's existence. It assumes everybody's going to see that God must be there. That's why the Bible comes along later, Psalm 14, Psalm 53, respectively, and say, they both say, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Genesis 1, 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. When you come into the world, you begin to understand life around you. It's, you're supposed to conclude that God must be there. God made it. In fact, the Word of God says the, not only the fool has said in his heart, but Karl Marx, Joseph Stalin were both fools. Kim Jong-un is a fool. Richard Dawkins, the famous uh, atheist uh, right, and evolutionist now, uh, is a fool. And um, there are a number of, of arguments or ways by which we conclude that God must be there. And that's what I want to preach to you today. So I call this sermon, Seven Testimonies for God. Seven Testimonies for God. First, for those of us who believe in the God of the Bible, we have the testimony of the Scripture itself. We shouldn't discount the Scripture, even though most of the world is completely ignorant of the Bible. And most professing Christians are ignorant of the Bible. You'd be hard-pressed to find too many Christians professing to believe in Jesus Christ in some of these modern churches that know anything about the Scriptures. Or they can tell you about what they're, they sell in their church bookstore. They can tell you about their sports team. They can tell you about the new gymnasium we're building for our young people. They can tell you about 
uh, what co kind of coffee we sell at our church coffee shop. They talk all kinds of things, but they know nothing about the scriptures. They're monumentally ignorant, and it's sad. It's tragic. And by the way, that ignorance is going to come back to haunt them someday. Don't think you can be ignorant of the Word of God when it's right there available to anybody and get away with it and say, well, I can just plead ignorance when I face the Lord Jesus Christ. No, you can't. You won't be able to. But um, first of all, we have the testimony from Scripture itself. And uh, we believe that God gave to the world a perfect book. We believe the book we hold in our hands has actually could be very uh, uh, well demonstrated that the book we possess in our hands uh, has shaped Western civilization for the last four or five hundred years like no other single influence has. And um, that could be very clearly demonstrated. But the Bible says, Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. When the sun comes up in the morning, that's a sermon that God made it. When the moon and the stars appear at night, that's a message from the Creator who created those things. That there's someone more intelligent than you, greater than you, bigger than you, more powerful than you, who put all those things in place. They didn't happen by themselves. Romans 1.20 goes even further. It says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Paul says that uh, the creation around you is supposed to teach you some things about God, about the very nature of God. 1 John 5 and verse 7, probably the single greatest verse on the Trinity, the triune nature of the Godhead, which is missing from every modern translation. They've eliminated it, omitted it right out of the Bible. 1 John 5 and verse 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's probably the single clearest verse on the Trinity, the identity of God, found anywhere in the Scriptures, and it's missing from all the modern translations. But the sun has three kinds of rays. It has heat rays, which you can feel but not see, type of the Holy Spirit. It has light rays, which you can see but can't feel, type of God manifest in the flesh, Christ. And then it has cosmic rays, which you can neither see nor feel, type of the pure essence of God the Father. Water, for example, can assume three forms, liquid, ice, and steam. And you can do different jobs with each one of those forms. And yet, neither one, none of those is more or less water than the other two. You could melt the ice, you could somehow collect the steam, and put it all back together with the liquid, and there would be no conflict in its chemical structure, H2O. So the scriptures attest to the existence of God, mainly by pointing you to the creation which you can see. It's the visible creation that argues that there must be a creator behind it. That's why the Bible doesn't spend a lot of time trying to prove God's existence. You're supposed to know that if you're not an idiot. Secondly, we have the testimony from human conscience. The testimony from human conscience. You can go all over the world, visit every primitive part of the world in sub-Saharan Africa or anywhere in the Middle East or anywhere in the Far East, anywhere in South America. Um, and you will find people who believe in the existence of some kind of God. It just seems to be automatic. You have to be educated to have that natural faith educated out of you. And they have some system of laws. They believe they have to make some atonement, usually by blood, or make some, make some offering to appease the wrath of their, their God. And, um, and perform some act of contrition or some good deed to uh, gain their God's favor once again. And the question is often asked, what about the heathen out in some remote part of the world that has never heard the Bible, never heard the gospel, never had a missionary go visit to them? Are they lost? 
And the plain and simple answer is yes, they're lost. They're just as lost as you were here in the United States before you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. The location has nothing to do with it. The Bible says in Romans 2, verses 14 and 15, But when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things which are written in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Before a man is confronted with the gospel, before he ever hears the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he's judged by his conscience. What does he know about good and bad? What does he know about right and wrong? The heathen out in some, we always think of the heathen as some people running around with no clothes on out in some jungle somewhere. That's sort of the, the, the image we have of the so-called heathen. But um, he's lost without Christ, just like anyone here in the United States or in South Korea or any modern industrialized country was lost before they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the heathen will be judged according to his conscience. Hence, his conscience will become a guilty conscience when he stands before God. He knew that certain things were right and wrong. He knew that it was wrong to lie. He knew that it was wrong to steal what didn't belong to him. He knew that it was wrong to disrespect his parents or his elders. He knew that it was wrong to commit murder. He knew that it was wrong to do a number of things. The conscience told him that that was wrong. Nobody had to instruct him in it. And then he goes ahead and he violates that conscience anyway. And so even without the gospel of Christ, he'll stand before God with a guilty conscience for having violated what he already knew to be right and wrong. And therefore, God will be just and justified in passing judgment on him. You can't look at the universe without your conscience telling you there's someone or something much bigger than you that put it in place. Acts 17, verse 23, the Apostle Paul tells the men of Athens, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Their consciences told them that there was a God somewhere, even if they knew little or nothing about him. And uh, understanding the existence of God and that you're going to have to face him in judgment is a matter of the conscience. Men deny the existence of God, uh, not because they can't find him, but they don't want to find him. It's the same reason a thief doesn't find a police officer. <laughs> He's not interested in finding a police officer. He doesn't want to find one. He wants to avoid one at all costs. And um, so the reason, and the reason you know, pass out tracks on the street corner or on the sidewalk, and the reason people take that track and they, you see them walk down the road after you've given it and they throw it on the ground and just keep going, they're not throwing it on the ground because they're afraid of what might be in it. They know what's in it. That's why they don't want to read it. All right, thirdly, there's the testimony that we call the, the testimony of cause. Testimony of cause, if I, if I can use that term. God created all men, according to Malachi 2, verse 10. Things don't just happen on their own. I'm going to run through the next several uh, um, points uh, more quickly for time's sake. Things don't just happen on their own. Uh, if there's a building, there must have been a builder. If there's a creation, there must have been a creator. Things will just happen on their own. What um, the so-called Big Bang, the big giant explosion that, that produced the universe, the visible universe. And the question comes up, what exploded? What exploded? Where did it come from? You can't say that suddenly all creation appeared. Well, there must have been something before that that had that exploded. So what exploded? And um, Kent Hoven, and he's not all right about everything, but he's got some great material on evolution and creation and the age of the earth and dinosaurs. He makes some very um, poignant arguments about what exploded. Where did all the matter come from? And he'll quote various um, science textbooks, and the writers will say that at one time, all the matter in the universe was compressed down to something as small 
as the period of the end of a sentence. And he'll show you the pages right in the textbooks. And suddenly that exploded into everything we have. Well, where, where did that come from? Things don't just happen by themselves. They have to have be, be planned. There has to be some reason, some purpose for it. You know, a, a, something as simple as a cardboard box requires a designer, requires a planner, someone to know where to put the bins, the creases, so you can fold it together when you need to. It's amazing that think that the universe, with all of its complexity, came about by itself. That is absurd. Fourthly, there is the testimony from design. The testimony from design. Not only is there a building, but there is an intelligence behind the building. Somebody drew up the plans or the blueprints. Uh, the architect designed a, a building or a house. And um, the visible creation was set in motion following the course which God had designed for it. That's clear enough from Psalm 82, verse 5, and Judges 5, verse 20. I'm not going to turn to those verses right now. But the creation that you and I see is the most orderly, systematic, mathematical, and precise functioning thing you and I could ever, could ever conceive of. It is by the visible movement of the planets and the known universe that we see by, by which, whereby we're able to count days and weeks and months and years and centuries and even reduce it down to seconds and one hundredths of a second and, and thousandths of a second so that, you know, this sort of a atomic clock every few years they move it forward like it gained one one thousandth of a second over the, well, how do they get that precise? Because the creation operates with that much precision. And if it happened all by itself, there's no reason to expect that it would do that. But it does. By the way, and I've said this to you many times before, God, if God made all of those things, he made the visible universe, the solar system, the Milky Way galaxy that our planet is supposed to be a part of, and the motion of all the planets and the, the objects in space that we see, he made all of those things, then God, by definition, is outside of those things. He's not limited to those things. He doesn't have to look at a watch and count days and time and hours and so forth. He made those things for our use, for our benefit. And so God is a transcendent being that goes beyond anything the, mar the mind of man can fully comprehend. The God of the Bible is so far beyond the comprehension of mortal man, it's, it's staggering that we can approach him at all. This is how far beyond a man's imagination the God of the scriptures is. Not so with the gods of other religions from time to time. But the creation is the design of an intelligent designer, an intelligent creator, an intelligent being. And number five, point number five, there is the testimony from morality, the testimony of morality. The laws of God are imprinted on the human heart, according to Romans 2, verse 15. Man is the only creature who makes laws and rules, and then he establishes punishments for if those laws and rules are broken, uh, so that he can keep some sense of order in society. By the way, man is the only creature that needs to make such laws. Think about that. Man is a moral being. Sometimes he becomes an immoral being when he violates what he knows to be right and wrong. He knows that certain conduct, certain virtues, certain qualities are automatically good or bad. They're automatically right or wrong. And um, he's interested in those things. And he thinks he can, the unsaved man thinks he can discover those things he can establish some sense of order and sanity in the world without God being involved. Big discovery. Guess what they're discovering these days? People who stay together and stay married for years usually have a happier life than those who don't. Wow! 
<laughs> Kids who grow up with the benefit of both dad and mom in the home generally are more well adjusted later in life than a kid who just has one or the other. What a great discovery. How do they, how do they stumble on that? How do they discover that truth? What a great revelation. The way to avoid getting VD is don't fool around with someone you're not married to. I don't know how these revelations come to modern man, but they do. Somehow they discover these things all on their own. You know, when someone wants to get elected to public office, particularly on a national scale, one of the issues that they seem to always have to have an opinion about or form a, 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 a policy about is the death penalty. Everybody knows that it's wrong to murder. And I think if everyone was truly honest, they would have to admit that nothing less than the life of the murderer is just payment for the life which he has taken. Right. Life in prison is not, the, is not proper payment for having taken someone else's life. Now, you're, you're basically rewarding him, giving a little pat on the hand, slap on the hand, and say, now go be comfortable in your jail cell. We'll spend 50, 60 grand a year to take care of you and pay for your medical needs for the rest of your life. You can write a book. You can take online courses. You can write your memoirs. Maybe they'll make a movie about your life and so forth, and your family will get royalties after you've ruined and devastated the lives of other people. Man's basically a moral being. That means he's interested in moral issues, he, in laws uh, which he knows he has to uh, obey and behavior. That doesn't mean men are basically good. They're not. I like what Dennis Prager said. Dennis Prager's an unsaved Jew whose commentaries I still enjoy. And he says, the world is a beautiful place. It's people who stink. <laughs> I think that's very well put. But um, the man who is interested in finding God ought to see that those moral laws are much bigger than himself. They come from someone who has much greater authority than he has. Point number six, there's the testimony of God from life itself. You can't get something living from something dead. And the evolutionists trace all life on the earth back to rocks. The Big Bang produced a universe filled with hard matter, rocks that cooled over centuries, and then they were rained upon for centuries after that. And eventually that formed the basic elements of which would become life once lightning struck it, and the very basic elements of life were suddenly appeared. And from that, all living organisms on the earth sprang. Yeah, right. A living puppy comes from a living dog, not a dead dog. Right. And um, where did the original life come from? The idea that everything just sort of combined together and once lightning struck it, uh, it sprang to life. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Psalm 36 verse 9 says, For with thee, God, is the fountain of life. John says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made, that was made. In him was life. All life began with Jesus Christ. All life began with the will of God and the word of God. In John 13, verse 23, when John leans upon Christ's bosom at the, in the upper room at their last supper, you think about the life beating in the heart of Christ John the Apostle has his ear, his head, about that far from the source of the universe. But we don't pause to think of the eternal life the, or, or, or the source of all life in the universe springing from Jesus Christ himself. And one of his disciples, that close to it. That's why John could write about himself as 
that disciple whom Jesus loved. And uh, it, it, it pays you. It's a blessing to um, dwell upon things of that kind from time to time. God might reveal to you some uh, insight, some observation, something you take notice of that you never had considered before. Life comes from life. It doesn't come from the Big Bang, Big Theory. If you read your Bible, you know that the creation didn't begin with a Big Bang. It's going to end with one, but it didn't start with one. A living creator made it. You say, how do we know that? Well, because you exist, don't you? You didn't come from something dead, nor did I. God, who is the eternal being, made you, he made me, he made all living things, and all those things are made for his own pleasure and to glorify him one day. Lastly, there is what we call the, the testimony from, and I'll give you a big word, congruity. Let me spell it for you. C-O-N-G-R-U-I-T-Y. Congruity. And this simply means the end result of faith versus the end result of atheism or no faith. It simply means atheism solves no problems. It provides no answers to the deepest needs, the deepest yearnings of man. And no question of the human heart is solved by skepticism, by doubt. Uh, but God can answer those questions. God can solve the human heart's problems. God can provide comfort when you're lonely. God can provide some measure of, of a sense when things make, seem to make no sense to you. America's 30th president, Calvin Coolidge, he was known for not talking a lot. He only spoke when he thought it was necessary and had something relevant to say. Otherwise, he didn't just ramble on all the time. But Calvin Coolidge said to a group of Boy Scouts in 1924, it is hard to see how a great man can be an atheist. We need to feel that behind us is intelligence and love. Doubters do not achieve. Skeptics do not contribute. Cynics do not create. What has atheism ever offered or contributed to the world or to the advancement of civilization? Where are the atheist hospitals? Where are the colleges and universities inspired by skepticism and doubt? There are no atheist-inspired orphanages. There are no atheist-inspired uh, burn centers or cancer treatment centers. There are no atheist-inspired uh, rescue missions. There are no uh, universities of higher learning inspired by Madeleine Murray O'Hare, uh, nor are there any charitable endeavors inspired by Robert Greene Ingersoll back in the 1800s. Bob Ingersoll, who was a Civil War uh, veteran, he got high honors, buried in Arlington Cemetery in 1899. But he spent the last 30 years of his life traveling around the country as an atheist, an aggressive atheist, trying to argue against God. And uh, he was like Madeleine Murray O'Hare, just an obnoxious person. And uh, he said the inspiration of the Bible largely depends on the ignorance of the man who's reading it. In other words, the more ignorant someone is, the more inspired he thinks the Bible must be. And about 30 years after he died, um, God raised up a former National League baseball player named Billy Sunday, saved him. Billy Sunday began traveling around this country like a, a, a revivalist and a preacher like the world had seen very few of prior to him. And he said, I've read the Bible from cover to cover, and if Bob Ingersoll isn't burning in hell, God is a liar and the Bible's not worth the paper it's printed on. He had the last say in the argument. Somehow God worked it out that way that Billy Sunday had the last say. Good for him. Do you know something? The world remembers who Billy Sunday was, but very few people know the name of Robert Greene Ingersoll. 
and and it hasn't taken very long, but very few Americans even remember the name of Madeleine Murray O'Hare from the 60s and early 70s. But they remember the name Billy Graham. They remember the name of great preachers in the past. They still remember the names of Dwight Lyman Moody. They still remember the names of great Christians in the past. Fanny Crosby's songs are still blessing our hearts uh, over a century later. So great Christians, God has a way of making their legacies to last because they're built on something. Where the atheist, is, his life, is his beliefs are built and based on nothing. But moving on, without God, there's no point whatsoever in anything we do. There's no reason why we should observe laws and act morally and virtuously and try to be kind to our neighbor, kind to our fellow man. If you see something you want, take it. You're not going to have to answer to anybody, right? You see somebody you're attracted to, you're married, they're married, go for it. Who cares? That's the mentality of the world without Jesus Christ. But uh, steal if you want to. Embezzle if you want to. Lie to your boss if you need to. Do whatever you have to do to make life comfortable for yourself. Because if there's no God, then ultimately you have nobody you're going to have to answer to. There's no one you're going to have to give an account to. And ultimately nobody can tell you what to do, what not to do, how to live or how not to live. And I don't think any of us would want to live in a world where there were no rules and there were no absolutes that everyone was expected to obey. I don't think I wouldn't want to live in a world like that. Kill someone if they get in your way, if they cause a trouble, cause problems for you. And the court system has no right to tell you you did wrong. They have no authority whatsoever to tell you that you violated the accepted standards. Who cares about the accepted standards? It's every man for himself. Evolution is the survival of the fittest, and I survived, and that guy didn't. Atheism answers no questions in the human heart. How do I find love? What am I really here for? How can I get over being afraid of death? Why does this thing or that thing make me sad? Why do I appreciate beautiful art, beautiful music? Why do those things resonate in my heart? What is it about me that longs for something greater than the world I'm living in? Atheism can't answer those questions. But the person of Jesus Christ, the grace and the mercy and the kindness and the love of God can, in fact, do those things for you. The Bible says, But he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It's a matter of faith and a matter of the will. I'm glad that I've trusted him. I'm glad that I know Jesus Christ as my Savior. Uh, the greatest decision I ever made in my life was made when I was six years old to trust Christ to save me and forgive me. And, um, and I've said this to you before, it's the greatest event of my early childhood. And it's just as vivid in my mind and my memories uh, today as if it happened two weeks ago. And I thank God for that.